that was my main task to also remind that as a lecturer i've many times forgotten myself. yeah it's good to remember because i already had yeah. forgotten all right thank you very much and um, so today uh, we're going to put the two pieces together that we talked about yesterday so yesterday i talked about the element of fluid dynamics and then i talked in the second hour about the schwinger kaddish formalism so today we're going to talk about fluid dynamics as an effective field theory, which uses the schwinger keldish formalism. So we will put the two things together. So let me motivate once more what it means. Uh, <clears throat> why do we need the schwinger keldish So we want, um, I motivated field the uh, fluid dynamics and I told you yesterday that there are, there are a couple of drawbacks in the conventional formulation using the equations of motion. One of it is that stochastic hydrodynamics is not systematically, cannot be systematically done. And another drawback is that uh, not all the correlation functions uh, are in incorporated in hydrodynamics. So we need an effective theory, effective field theory formulation in order to, to make up for these uh, uh, deficiencies. So an effective field theory formalism means that uh, you start with some UV uh, partition function, let's say, that depends on the sources. So it's a microscopic, um, <clears throat> with microscopic definition as follows, where S is some microscopic action. And you think about integrating out all the high energy degrees of freedom, and you're left only with these uh, infrared modes with an effective action. So with some other low energy modes. But this uh, effective action won't do the, won't capture all the uh, physical processes in fluid dynamics because in particular it won't caps, capture dissipation because it's made of just one single variable. So instead, uh, natural and more convenient starting point is a schwinger keldish partition function, which has this double structure. So all the microscopic fields are doubled. The microscopic action is doubled. The sources are doubled. And you have this uh, minus sign over here, which uh, um, takes care of the anti-evolution in the lower part of the schwinger keldish contour. And consequently, also the effective action will have some doubled structure. So all the uh, dynamical fields, the infrared fields, will also be doubled. And uh, so this is the object that we are after. So an effective action, which comes from an underlying schwinger keldish structure, which has this uh, doubled uh, um, field theory structure. So one thing that we already noticed is that uh, this effective action does not factorize, unlike the macro microscopic counterpart. So this effective action, the two dynamical degrees of freedom are coupled with one another. And this feature is what will allow you to have dissipative effects. So the fact that the two fields are coupled, coupled together. It also depends on the initial state because the path integral is taken over some initial state data. And it satisfies the properties that follow, which follow from the properties of the underlying schwinger keldish partition function, which follow from general principles like microscopic unitarity and CPT invariance. So because the schwinger keldish partition function has to satisfy certain properties, we will require similar properties on the dynamical fields of the effective action. So property one uh, will tell you that whenever you set, uh, remember that uh, we can parameterize the <clears throat> all the fields in an average and difference basis in schwinger keldish that's the convenient basis in which you parameterize your fields and sources and operators. 
So the first property would tell you that so whenever all the dynamical fields, uh, the difference ones are set to zero, the effective action is going to be zero. The second property is about is about uh, the the complex conjugation of this effective action, and you will see that if you take the complex conjugate, it will be minus this same effective action where the difference field acquire a minus sign. Uh, then we need to require that the imaginary part of the effective action is positive semi-definite. This comes from the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality of the schwinger keldish path integral, and it will ensure that the path integral is well-defined uh, after all. Then we will need to require that all the local symmetries are double. And whenever we have the microscopic, the thermal, the initial state to be a thermal state, and whenever we have microscopic invariance, there is going to be an additional constraint on the effective action, which has to do with uh, mapping the fields into some um, CPT conjugate ones with uh, some uh, shift in the in, um, imaginary time. And this particular property will implement the KMS conditions, for example, and it will implement, uh, it will give a lot of constraints on the correlation functions. So these are the properties that we want to require on the effective action. And in addition, we also want to talk about hydrodynamics. This means that we want to be in the limit where the fluctuation, the perturbations are much larger than this uh, microscopic scales. And therefore, we are talking about a derivative expansion. And so the effective action is also given in some derivative expansion. Okay, <clears throat> so before uh, going into like the full details of uh, how to apply this formalism to hydrodynamics, let me see like let us see like a very, very simple example so that we see like some of the salient features already before all the complications which are coming from hydrodynamics. So we consider this example where the infrared variables are two um, fields which depend on time. So these two fields. And we want to write the most general effective action, which is quadratic and an expansion in time derivatives. Okay. So I claim this is the most general effective action that you can write. So we see that property one, which was telling that the effective action is zero when you set the, uh, the difference dynamical fields to zero, will tell you that the effective action depends at least linearly on the A-type fields. So this is how the property one is implemented. The property two, um, which is about um, the imaginary part of the effective action, will tell you that the terms which are quadratic in, uh, in the other A-type fields I have to be imaginary. So this is property two. And so let me write it. And And uh, so property three, which is about the imaginary part of the effective action being positive semi-definite, will imply that this coefficient here will have to be positive semi-definite. And then the property five, which is about the KMS condition, is uh, not implemented yet. So we have to do, we have to see how to, we have to implement this um, property on the effective action. And by the way, I wrote this effective action in this way because I parameterized uh, derivatives. So this term will be order one in time derivatives. This term will be order one derivative. This term will be order two derivatives. And um, all the other terms that I didn't write would be just total derivatives. And I neglect all the terms which are higher than two derivatives. 
So the reason that I wrote this term over here, which is order one in <coughs> derivative, is because this term here will be related to this one through this KMS symmetry that I'm going to write. So how to see this? So this one, uh, we need to say that the effective action is going to be invariant under a transformation which will bring our fields to this form. But uh, I don't want to take, uh, it's hard for me to take care of this minus t um, in the argument of these fields. So I'm going to define a slightly different uh, transformation because I think about a Lagrangian, I think about an effective action, which is basically a Lagrangian so written in this form. which depends also on derivatives. And this Lagrangian is going to be, because of uh, it's under this, the integral, because of uh, primary parameterization invariance, this is going to be equal to this one here. where I have to take uh, the time derivatives to be uh, with the opposite sign, let's say. Therefore, <clears throat> this will imply that instead of taking this transformation, it's convenient to take this other one, which is much simpler to implement. And I have to take the derivative to the minus derivative. So this is the one that we are interested in. Okay, and in particular, in the RA basis, this is going to be of this form. You can show that this is the case. And here I've taken a derivative expansion where x of t minus ib, I can write it as a, an exponential which acts as a time translation operator on x, and then I can expand it in a oops. in a derivative expansion, and it will become something like this. Okay. Okay, so this is basically the transformation that we will be using so it's a KMS transformation and it acts on the fields like this. Okay, so now you can see, you can look at these terms. Uh, I won't do the full exercise, you can do it at home. So you can see that the first term over here in the effective action, so this one here. So the R-type fields will be basically unchanged by this transformation, but the A-type field will be changed by this transformation. But it will be changed in a way that you can rewrite it, the extra term, which comes from this term over here, as a total derivative. So actually, this term will be preserved. 
by this KMS symmetry, because the additional extra terms will be just total derivatives. And the same will happen for this term here. So we need to take care of these two terms over here. So if you perform the transformation, the one that I've written here, you will see that you will have to impose a condition between this gamma and these uh, beta functions. So actually, a condition of this form. which is uh, also has a name, it's called the Einstein relation. Okay, so this is the most general effective action that you can write for this problem up to second order in derivatives. And you notice that you have to impose a condition on some of the coefficients. And this condition is precisely linked to the fluctuation dissipation theorem because it relates a term which is responsible for dissipation to a term which is responsible for fluctuation. So this is the kind of relation that Einstein derived in the problem of Brownian motion. And here we are deriving this in this uh, bigger formalism of the schwinger keldish uh, effective field theory approach. So this is very neat. So let's go on and see a little bit of the implications. And uh, so what we can see is that uh, we can take a Legendre transform of one of these uh, of these uh, A-type variables of this form. So we introduce another variable psi for which we take uh, this Legendre transform. And therefore the effective action that I wrote before, uh, so this one here, which was of this form, where remember this gamma and, B and beta are related. So this one here, after the <clears throat> Legendre transform, will acquire this form. Gamma. R dot, where I've taken a, a total derivative to write this term, okay. say plus I, ah, oh, sorry, so term minus psi, psi A plus I, dt, one over beta psi squared. Okay, so now if you remember a little bit from the lecture of yesterday, this term here is basically the Langevin equation, which was an equation for this uh, Brownian particle together with some stochastic noise, some random force over here, this psi, which is, uh, taken and average it over the form of the stochastic noise. And in this case, it's just Gaussian noise. So we have seen that we have reproduced an example yesterday, of yesterday, which we instead kind of cook up, cooked up by hand. And here it is implemented uh, systematically. And we can also say that uh, Having this in mind, we can give a little bit of an interpretation of what the quantities that I introduced. So for example, these average uh, dynamical variables, you can think of them as the physical position of the particle. While these difference variables, because they are the Legendre conjugate of the stochastic noise, You can interpret them as position noise. They are the fluctuation variables. And then we see that this beta term, this one over here, is related to the imaginary part of the effective action. 
which has to be positive semidefinite, and it's also related to fluctuation terms. And the other thing that we can see is from, uh, from this term over here, we can deduce that uh, the green, the two-point function GRA is proportional, let's say, to gamma. Remember, this is like the retarded Green's function. And GRR, which is this term over here, is proportional to beta. But we know that uh, we just show that beta and gamma are related. So this will imply that GRA and GRR, so G retarded and G symmetric are related in precisely the way that it's dictated by the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So this is very neat. And okay, so here I stopped at quadratic order in the fields, and in particular at quadratic order in the A-type fields. So the structure that we found is that the effective action has uh, roughly speaking this form, is that at linear order in A-type fields, you have the equations of motion. <clears throat> and then you have like, some other terms which are related to fluctuations. But you could have principle gone further and write higher order terms in these A type field expansions. So these type of terms, while the quadratic terms are related to Gaussian noise, they will give some contribution also to stochastic fluctuations, but non-Gaussian. So that's why I'm saying that uh, this schringer keldish uh, effective ulterior approach is uh, capable of systematically account uh, stochastic uh, hydrodynamics because it can systematically account for all these additional terms instead of imposing by hand uh, the equations or phenomenologically what type of noise do you have. You just have to see what, what is the result of this calculation and uh, look at what are the implications on your equations of motion and on your coefficients, okay? All right. <clears throat> so, so now what we have to do is to apply this general philosophy to the case of hydrodynamics. And uh, I'm taking as an example, relativistic hydrodynamics, because it's actually simpler than the non-relativistic case. So as we saw, the relativistic hydrodynamics can be seen as a conservation of a stress energy tensor. But what is convenient to do is to introduce a source. And the source that it's uh, due to the stress energy tensor is just the metric. So therefore, the equations that you're looking at is this covariant derivative of t minus is equal to zero. So in z, the partition function will depend on the source, g mu nu. And now let me take for this uh, page, the moment, the, just the single variable perspective instead of the doubled copy, because um, it's just simpler. So, in order to implement this equation, it's convenient to require diffeomorphism invariance. So we want to require that the partition function is equal to the same partition function where G is transformed under diffeomorphism transformations. <clears throat> so 
So therefore, so this will implement uh, the fact that uh, the stress energy tensor will be conserved in this way. In fact, what we want to do is to write a local partition function and a local actually effective action in this form where this field, where this additional field is introduced such that as I said, the partition function has to be invariant under diffeomorphisms. And the equations of motion for this additional field correspond to the conservation of the stress tensor. So it turns out that uh, this is possible if I ask these two variables, so the source and the variable x mu, to be combined in the effective action in a combination of this form, where g i j is now d i x mu, d j x mu, g mu nu x of sigma, where x mu are vectors that also transform under diffeomorphisms. Okay, so you can see that this combination here, this gij, is by construction invariant under diffeomorphisms. So because x will transform precisely to cancel the transformations of under diffeomorphisms of the source, g minu. So therefore, this requirement will be satisfied. And the second requirement, we can check that this is true because we can vary the effective action with respect to these fields X. And this will be given by something like this, let's say. Square root of G, G is the determinant of the metric. This is a simple variation of the metric where Tij is defined as usual. As a variation of the metric. And I can expand this term as the gradient of delta x, roughly speaking. And performing a total derivative, you can show that this term up to total derivative is written in this way. Okay, so you see that if you want to impose, impose that the variations of the effective action with respect to these fields x is zero, you will have to require that this quantity is zero. So precisely this condition is also satisfied. So basically these X's become the dynamical fields for which the equation of motion <clears throat> correspond to the hydrodynamic equations of motion. Okay. So this is how you would implement uh, this. You need the diffeomorphism invariance in order to implement uh, relativistic hydrodynamics. If you leave a Newton Cartan, you will need a different symmetry. So not just diffeomorphism invariance, but you need also some minimum symmetry and a gauge invariance and coupling to additional sources in order, for, uh, in order to get the equations of motion relative to Galilean hydrodynamics, let's say. Okay.
So what are the degrees of freedom of hydrodynamics? Well, in this relativistic case, they're precisely these functions that I introduce because they are the ones for which the equations of motion give the equations of motion of hydrodynamics. And they can be seen as maps between this intermediate space sigma. So say I label, uh, say I have a three-dimensional space, and this will be just the spatial coordinates of this uh, three-dimensional space. So this x mu of sigma zero and sigma is a map from this, uh, from one frame labeled by sigma to another frame labeled, labeled by axis. And we can interpret it as follows. So if one point over here, uh, we can interpret this, uh, this space as a fluid frame, and this is as a physical space, And one point over here is taken in this space by the function x mu of a specific sigma as varying sigma zero. So it represents the word line of a fluid element sigma in the physical space as we vary the proper time sigma zero of the fluid element itself. So these maps are maps basically from the Eulerian frame and the Lagrangian frame of hydrodynamics. And because we are talking in the Schwinger curve dish, we actually have two maps. So we have a physical space one and a map one, and we have an analogous map into a second physical space. So while here we have one source, we will have another source over here. And we will have two independent uh, uh, diffeomorphisms in balance. Let's call this coordinate space. Uh, diff invariance two and diff invariance one. Okay, so we have a double set of degrees of freedom. A doubled local symmetry. And therefore we will define not just one quantity on the fluid frame, through this pullback of the hydrodynamic variables. But we will also define another one. And we will require that uh, the effective action is invariant under both of these uh, diffeomorphisms. And therefore it will be a function of both of these gij1 and gij2, which are automatically already invariant under the two diffeomorphisms. And because the reparameterization on the fluid frame is arbitrary, We require that there is also a diffeomorphism in the fluid frame. That means that we will write this effective action as an invariant object in this fluid frame. So along these indices ij, which are indices parameterizing the fluid frame over here. Okay, <clears throat> there is a technical problem in implementing both of these uh, 
diffeomorphism symmetry together with the schwinger keldish property over here. So if we want that uh, there is a limit in which the sources are set to zero and they will give this uh, simpler, the simple partition function, and we want to implement this on the fluid frame, naively we would think that we would need to define this difference variable on the fluid frame. However, this is only true for some specific field configuration because this gij on the fluid frame, they depend on the values of the dynamical variables. So this will be true for some specific field configuration, but not for general field configurations. So there is a tension with implementing this double diffeomorphism invariance and this condition on the schwinger keldish partition function. So to overcome this uh, technical problem, one takes uh, one convenient way, way to do is to take a classical limit. So that means that you take h bar going to zero and you're neglecting all the quantum fluctuations. So you're keeping in the game only statistical fluctuations. And so there is a full reparameterization of this. Um, you can take these expansions of the sources as expansions in the average variables and in the difference variables in an expansion in h bar. And the same is done for the dynamical fields. So there is a parameter for which I'm taking this expansion. And therefore I can define this quantity over here. So this jr hat, which will be the one that I wanted to define. So this will be the combination one plus two, the average combination. And the difference combination will be of this form. Where G R I J is just the I X mu R, G J X mu R, G mu nu R, X R, G A I J is D I X mu R, G mu nu A X R. And this rho A here is related to the A type dynamical variable. It's the pullback or the push forward of this dynamical value. Okay, so the upshot of doing this classical limit is that the double diffeomorphisms now become <clears throat> a diffeomorphism in the R direction and a linearized diff in a type, in, um, <clears throat> for the A type fields. So because this quantity will be invariant under full diffeomorphisms, and this quantity will be invariant under, under, only under this linearized diffeomorphisms. A, a quick question. Yes. So this uh, G A I J. Yes. Which is the difference? That that should still be zero for specific for for some specific yeah. configuration. Yeah. So it will be zero now. It depends only on one single field X R. So, and because it depends on one single XR, it will be, uh, yeah, so to, you can set it to zero without problems of implementing this uh, schwinger keldish symmetry. Uh, okay. In the other case here, it was depending on two different uh, uh, ah, yeah. dynamical variables. And now, now you have circumvented that. Yeah, okay, I yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a somewhat uh, technical, uh, uh, problem, but uh, you can solve it with this classical limit. Okay. And one last piece of ingredient that we need is that uh, we need to characterize. I always told you that effective action depends on the initial state data. And the initial state here is a thermal state. So we need to characterize what is this thermal state. And I tell you that this state is characterized by a vector. So this vector, in a sense, represents the initial state velocity field. 
This factor is, normal, is not normalized and its normalization can be interpreted as the temperature, the initial temperature of the state. So what is this bi? It's a killing vector. So this means that there is a metric which is defined in the past for which beta is the killing vector. So this is the metric uh, that couples to the initial thermal state. So beta is the killing vector. Given the killing vector, I can construct a conserved current and the conserved charge, which corresponds to time translations. So, <clears throat> so on each uh, time slice, there is this conserved charge. And therefore, this beta H generates, because uh, it's associated to a symmetry, generates time translations. And each uh, operator of this form is written like this, which we defined as having an operation like this, like an exponential. And in this, uh, using this more covariant way of characterizing the initial state, we can write this operation as a lead derivative along the beta field. So this is how we characterize time translations for this initial state, given the initial thermal state written in a covariant way. So the data of the initial state is this uh, vector. Uh, Natalia, just it's my test to also keep the time. That, that's 10 more minutes. So yeah, it, yeah, I'm almost so done. That's still a solid 10 minutes, but, but yeah. That you okay. know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now we finally are at the point where we want to write the effective action for hydrogen atoms because now I've given all the ingredients. So we want to write, well, actually the Lagrangian, which is a function of this GIJR fields of GIJA head fields, the initial state data and the derivatives. So because I wrote this in this way, so using these combinations, so these are the particular combination of the dynamical fields and sources, these two fields are invariant under the diffeomorphism symmetry, under the doubled diffeomorphisms. So we want to write this Lagrangian as a, um, as a word, as a fluid frame invariant object. So we want to write it where all the indices ij are contracted with one another. So that we also have this reparameterization invariance on the sigma frame. So the, the frame where the fluid is defined. So I claim that the general Lagrangian is written in this form. So this square root of uh, g appear because of reparameterization symmetry. G beta. So there are a couple of important terms. So G beta, G hat, A K L, plus I L beta, G R K L. So I've written only the terms which are uh, up to linear order in um, derivatives and up to quadratic order in A-type fields. Okay, so 
why I wrote this term. So this will be the term which is order zero of derivatives. This will be order one. And this will be also order, sorry, order d. And this will be also order one in derivatives. <clears throat> okay. So this effective action, you can see that it's written in a way that it's invariant under the parameterizations of the fluid frame. It is linear in the A-type fields. This was one of the requirement of one of the symmetries that we've imposed. Then we see that the terms which are quadratic in A-type fields, they are imaginary. So this was requirement of symmetry one. This was a requirement of symmetry two. And uh, we still need to take care of the KMS symmetry. So the KMS symmetry, now in this case, we can uh, write it like this. So we want to add to the present Lagrangian a term which is, uh, in, instead of like imposing um, the KMS symmetry as I did before, like imposing like a constraint on the coefficient, let me directly add to the Lagrangian the KMS transformed Lagrangian so that the final Lagrangian will be invariant under this symmetry, under the KMS symmetry, such that K square of the Lagrangian is equal to the Lagrangian itself. And this can be done. You just need to say how the fields are transforming. For example, this one would be at i at a j, g i j r, g hat a is going to be eta i at a j, g i j a hat plus e li beta. So notice that this transformation has a similar structure to the one for the simple example of the, of the single dynamical field. So the A-type field is transformed in an A-type field plus a time derivative, which now has become defined covariantly through a Lie derivative. And this eta i and eta j are the CPT eigenvalues. For example, eta zero is going to be equal to minus one. You can choose eta x to be equal to minus one and at a y equal to one, et cetera. So you can see, and then I have to define how this transforms for the beta field, for the initial state. And I have to take care also of the derivatives. And combining these two together, you can see that the transformation of the lead derivative is going to be minus the lead derivative. So now you can see that on this term, if I take the transformation under kappa of this, you will get basically this term over here, this whole term over here. And if you take a transformation under the KMS symmetry of this whole term, because you also have to take this you will get a cancellation between a term, a lead derivative, which is generated by this term, and minus the lead derivative, which is generated by this term. So you will basically interchange the, this combination with this combination over here through the KMS symmetry. So these two combinations will be interchanged. Therefore, for the KMS symmetry to be satisfied, what you have to do is basically you have to take the symmetric combination of this uh, term in the Lagrangian. And to satisfy the KMS uh, symmetry on this term over here, you will have to take another constraint, which is that any contribution which is coming to this term from the lead derivative which will be generated by this, by the KMS transformation of this, has to be of a total derivative form.
Okay. So now let me copy this on this side. No. Okay. Okay, so this was our uh, Lagrangian. So now we have to provide what are these things here, these functions over here. So Tij zero R can be written as P plus epsilon as functions of T. Well, this is equal to T times beta I and T remember is this combination here. A scalar, it's a scalar which is invariant under the diffeomorphisms on the fluid frame. So this is the most general form that you can write for this uh, term, which appears in the Lagrangian at zero order in derivatives. And you can see that I written it already in the suggestive form that suggests that this is related to the constitutive relations of ideal hydrodynamics, where P and epsilon are going to be related to the pressure and the energy density. And in fact, they are if you impose the constraint that I wrote over here. So if this one is imposed, you can see that you can interpret this as pressure and energy density. It turns out that this term will not contribute because it will be given just proportional to the equations of motion. And finally, this term over here can be written in this generic form, and it has to be at zero order in derivatives because you already have one derivative order over here. So you can write it in this suggestive form. So it has to be symmetric uh, with respect to the exchange of both indices, but also symmetric with respect to this single indices IJKL because it's contracted with the indices of a metric. So this term is uh, just GRIJ. Yes, UI. So it's a projector in the transverse direction of the velocity. And as you may, may imagine, this will be related to the shear viscosity. And this one will be related to the bulk viscosity. So basically the constitutive relations are given by taking the derivative of the effective action with respect to the A type fields. And you see that you precisely get P plus epsilon, U E, U J, plus P, G R, I J, minus T, and then this term over here, P I K, P J L plus two P eta P I J P K L multiplied by the lead derivative. plus second order coefficients. And the imaginary part of the effective action has to be positive semi-definite. It will imply that the shear viscosity and the bulk viscosity are positive semi-definite. Okay, so Natalia, this- Yeah, yeah, I'm- to interrupt you, but time is- Indeed, yeah. so I'm this is the last thing that. that I wrote. 
Yeah. This is the last thing that I wrote. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, I've been able to convince you that this whole formalism, we can redevise hydrodynamics equations. So this will be the consecutive relation. These are some constraints that I impose you. And I'll leave you with the last uh, page for, for wonder. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot for a really nice combination today in, the, in deriving with Plistic Hydro, very beautiful. Um, just to remind you, yeah, stop the recording. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks.